Well, good morning, church. How's everybody feeling today? D plus, D plus. So right now we are continuing a series that we have called, What's the Point? I know I haven't been the only person who's ever felt that way going through this life. It's easy a lot of times to, to look at the situations that you're going through and ask yourself, what is the point of all of this? What's the point of this life? God, why are you allowing me to go through this pain? Lord, why are you allowing me to go through this hurt? Why am I going through all of this? We find ourselves here a lot. So many times in our life and in, in this culture especially, it's about the destination, right? It, it, once I get this job, once I, once I get promoted, once I'm a mother, once I'm a father, once I'm married and I finally reach the pinnacle of my life, th- we're good. But I want you to know that in this life, it's not about the destination. It's about the journey God's taking you on. Along this journey, there's gonna be things that you're gonna go through. You're gonna go through pain, you're gonna go through mourning, you're gonna go through, uh, you're gonna go through hurt, there are gonna be situations in your life you're like, man, what's the point? I want you to know that God's teaching you something. God doesn't make mistakes. He takes your pain and he redeems it. He takes your hurt, he takes your circumstances, and he turns it to something good. It's an opportunity to rely on him. So in this series, we're going through uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9. We're looking at a story of a man named Saul. So Saul, he would become the first king of Israel. These were God's chosen people from the Old Testament. But before he became king, truly walked in his calling, he had to go on a mission to find some donkeys. Today, we're gonna be talking about something that I believe that every single person in this room deals with to some degree. We're gonna be talking about excuses. I heard some O's. I saw, here we go. We're gonna be talking about excuses. I wanna ask you, when was the last time you made an excuse? Today, last week? This is something that happens all the time, but a lot of times, this this is the truth. We don't realize we are making excuses in the moment. But when we look back at our life, hindsight is always 2020, we realize, man, my excuses have held me back in so many ways. Here's the thing with excuses. They hold us back from our full potential. They hold us back from all that God has for us. I remember growing up, I played baseball. And this was something I loved to do. I was on AAU teams. I had some incredible coaches who really poured into me, that really looked after me. And before I'd go up to bat, they would look at me and be like, listen, you, you have the potential to be the best hitter in this league. You have the potential to be the best pitcher in the state of Florida. And you know they're trying to build me up, right? Give me some confidence. But every time I'd walk away, I'm like, potential? What, what is, that means I'm not that good yet, right? <laughs> That means I'm not the best hitter in the league. That means I'm not the best hitter on this team. That means I'm, I'm not the best pitcher in the state of Florida. Potential. Excuses, they hold us back from all that God has for us. When I hear the word excuses, another word that I associate with excuses is the word mediocrity. Being mediocre. What does mediocrity look like? You get, It looks like the world. It looks like broke, right? There's a lot of broke people. There's a lot of people in debt, people who are lonely, people who are living in fear, people who are discouraged, people who are selfish, defeated. I want you to know that Christ Jesus has not created you to be mediocre in this life. He hasn't. He hasn't created you to live in fear. He hasn't hasn't created you to live in worry. He has created you to be victorious, to walk in your calling, to not look at the darkness in this world and be timid and feel like, man, there's no hope in this situation. There's no hope in the public school system. There's no hope in government. No, no, no. We can triumph over darkness. We don't have to live in darkness. We don't have to live in fear or, or despair. I believe today that through the power of the Holy Spirit, excuses from what have been holding you back in your life and in your calling are going to leave today in Jesus' name. That's what I believe with all my heart. 
So before we get into the message today, would you guys just lift up your Bibles? We're gonna pray. This right here, this is life. This right here is truth. As cultures change and shift and evolve, there's something that doesn't change, that always gives you hope. It's the promises of God. Lord Jesus, I pray for your word today, that it'll penetrate our hearts, Lord Jesus, that it'll bring conviction, that it'll bring encouragement, Lord. Today, we call upon your name. I pray, God, that this message today isn't from me, remove me out of the way, but that your spirit speaks to us today. In your name I pray, amen. So a couple weeks ago, we had Pastor Matt Keller here. It was an incredible job. He was excited. He got me excited. He got all y'all excited. But we've been using his book as an invitation for people. So I want to encourage you if, you, if you didn't get a book, we have 60 left for free. For free. So if you want to get one, go into the lobby. We've got 60 left for free. We had 200, but first service got 140. So early bird gets the worm. So in this, in this series, we're, we're looking at the same story from 1 Samuel chapter nine, but every single week we're looking at a different angle from the story on how we can apply it to our life. So we're gonna start in 1 Samuel chapter nine, verse two. So Kish had a son, his name was Saul. Now Saul, he was handsome as a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel. He was a head taller than anyone else. So Saul, good looking guy handsome man, probably had a lot of favor, maybe blessed very often because of his good looks. He was very, had a lot of favor in his life. So this week I got with Pastor Tim. He's like our, our Bible nerd here on staff. And I was like, let's do a theological dive on what Saul could have looked like. So me and Pastor Tim, we came up with an idea of what he kind of looked like, if you want to throw that picture up. So <laughs> he, he probably looked something like this, you know, in this picture, I'm sure Endless Love is playing by Lana Ritchie and <laughs> Diana Ross, solo sung by Missy Lane. But, you know, that guy doesn't have all the characteristics Saul grew into. But he probably looked something like that. So, in verse 3, now the, now the donkeys belonging to Saul's father, Kish, were lost. And Kish said to his, to his son Saul, take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. So they go on this mission, they, and it's not going well. Okay, they, they go to four different places. They're looking for these donkeys and they cannot find them anywhere. Finally, they reach a place called Zuth and look what happens next in verse five. It says, when they reached the district of Zuth, Saul said to the servant who was with him, come, let's go back or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and start worrying about us. So in this moment, Saul, he wants to quit. He's been to four different towns. He's, he's getting to Zuth and he's like, man, I'm tired. I don't want to do this anymore. But thankfully, the servant that was with him had another idea in verse six. But the servant replied, look in this town. There is a man of God. He is highly respected. And everything he says comes true. So in this town, there was a prophet there named Samuel. Very respected. He was a man of God. What he said came to pass. Perhaps he will tell us what way we need to take. In verse seven, Saul said to his servant, but if we go, what can we give the man? The food in our sacks is gone. We have no gift to take to the man of God. What do we do? So in this moment, things are getting difficult. They're tired. They've been to many towns looking for these donkeys. It is not going the way they thought it would go. And what happens in this moment? Saul makes an excuse. Now his servant who's with him gives him a very great option. Hey, let's go talk to Samuel. But he says, but. This is where a lot of our excuses, they always begin with but, right? But if we go, what can we take to the man of God? We don't have any food. We don't have any money. Now before we start dogging on Saul, and be like, man, this guy's supposed to be the, the next king of Israel. How in the, listen, so many of us do this in our life all the time, right? You know, January 1st, every year, people are like, you know what, this is the year. I'm gonna exercise, I'm gonna join Crunch Fitness like everybody else in Pinellas County. I'm, I'm, this is the year, I'm gonna get in shape and then we're gonna go work out. And then we wake up and we're like, but I'm tired, right? But I, I'm sore, you know, I need a new mattress. You know, I just don't know if, if I can do this. 
You know, this is the year I'm gonna start eating healthy. So you, you go to Whole Foods, you're excited, and you walk in and you're like, but ground beef is $30 a pound. I, I, can't, I can't do this. How, how can I do this? But we do this with everything, right? Our to-do list, our homework, our housework, or paperwork, really, any type of work. So my question is, what is your butt keeping you from? <laughs> not, not, not that butt, what is your excuse, right? What's the thing that is holding you back? So last week, Pastor Glenn talked about his garage and, and how disorganized it was and how he needed a helping hand. He calls me, he goes, I've got these pastoral hands, I, I, need, I need your help. And I just wanna confirm how disorganized this garage really was. It looked like an episode from Hoarders. <laughs> Christmas stuff everywhere, I was like, is there a person in here? Like, this is, it was terrible. But what he failed to mention was he asked me in December and I kicked the can down the road for about six or seven months, okay? So he made me look good last week, but I'm gonna be honest with you this week. Every single week, he's like, hey, my Christmas present, pastoral hands, I need your help. <laughs> and every single week, I gave him an excuse, but, but I got babies, man. But, but I'm going on this youth trip, but I got this coming up. Eventually, in July or August, I was like, okay, I'll do it. The problem with July and August in Florida is it's 174 degrees outside. Like, if hell is anything like a garage in Florida in the summer, I do not want to go. I'm in that garage, I am pouring sweat, I'm in a puddle, I've drank probably 30 bottles of water, I am dying. And I'm thinking to myself, man, why did I make these excuses? I just kicked this can down the road for so long, I'm, I'm hot, I'm gonna pass out. But where have you been making an excuse in your life? How long are we going to let the same excuses come up in our life to keep us from what God has for us? Our greater mission, our purpose. Here's the truth, in reality, we can find an excuse for anything we want. We can find an excuse for anything. I got babies, I'm tired, I'm, I'm working 40, 50 hours a week, I, I can't do it, but, I'm, but I, it's too expensive. We can always find an excuse, but here's the truth. If something is important to you, we will prioritize it. We will make it happen. It's not like, hey, I wanna be a good dad if I, if I get enough time. No, 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 I'm gonna be there for my kids. I'm gonna go to their events. I'm gonna spend time with them. This isn't something, an option of what I'm going to do. Me getting into God's word, it's not an option. I'm prioritizing it in my life. A lot of times we give ourselves an out. If I have time, if, I, if things slow down, here, here's the truth, things don't slow down. They get busier and busier and busier. So what we have to do in our life, if, if something is important to us, we need to prioritize it. So with these excuses, where do they come from? They come from three different places in this story. The first one is pride. Verse five, it says, come, let's go back or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and he'll start worrying about us. So in this moment, Saul, his ego kicks in, right? Hey, the donkeys, it's okay. We can get some new one, at the, you know, they're having that sale next weekend, we'll get some new donkeys. What about me, right? I'm, I'm handsome, I've got favor, everyone loves me. We do this in our lives all the time. We, our culture, we love ourselves. Our culture is filled with pride. In our culture, we, we want comfort. It makes us feel nice. We, we, we don't wanna hit opposition. We wanna be as comfortable as we possibly can be. In a culture that preaches self-love, love yourself, just do what makes you happy. It's all about you. Now, the, the, the problem with this philosophy is it's rooted and wrapped in pride. The first sin, what caused Lucifer to fall from, he from heaven? Pride. He heard that worship and he's like, man, I don't want that to go to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I want that for myself. I need some more of that in my life. 
pride, being filled with himself. But the, the world and Instagram and what we see on the news, this isn't our model as followers of Christ. Our model is Jesus, the servant of all. The Bible says he didn't come to be served, but to serve. He could have came any way he wanted to. He could have been born into a palace. It's, no, he came humbly as a child. The last thing he did before he went to the cross, the most selfless thing of all human nature, he went to the cross, bore our sins upon him so that you and I could have eternity with him, where we could have a redo in this life, where we could be washed clean, be forgiven. Before he did that, he washed his disciples' feet. How humble is that? What goes before the fall? Pride. Self-indulgence, self-love. So in your life, when, when you hit opposition, you feel like, man, this is beneath me. Why, why am I going through this again? Are you gonna quit? No, no, it, it's time to stop relying on yourself, on the strengths Christ has given you, and truly begin to rely on the spirit of God. That's it. The next place excuses come from, it's fear. Now the servant, he gave him a real option. Let's go talk to Samuel in verse seven. Saul said to his servant, but if we go, what can we give the man? The food in our sacks is gone. We have no gift to take to the man of God. What do we have? So instantly, Saul jumps into fear mode. What do we have? Well, we don't have enough food. We, we, don't have any, we don't have a gift. What is Saul afraid of? Saul was afraid that if, if we go to this prophet and we meet him and, with, and we don't have this customary stuff, I'm gonna be rejected. Inside his head, you can kind of hear him saying, what if I'm not good enough? Plain and simple, he was afraid to fail. He was afraid that he didn't have what it took. And so many people live their life this way, crippled by fear. Fear of rejection, feeling not qualified to do something for God. I want you to know this, that every single person in this room was created by God for a reason. He did not just create you to go to work. He didn't create you to be successful or just to gain followers. He created you to do something for him. When he created you, he said, I did something good. He didn't say, you know, they could do something. No, no, no. He said, I did something good. He knit you together in your mother's womb. And he has a mission for you. He's got a mission for you. You have a calling on your life. Don't let the fear of rejection be an excuse in your life anymore. Because here's the truth. This is where the enemy wants you to be. He wants you to live in fear. He wants you to be crippled by fear, looking at the situations, because what happens when we're crippled, we're ineffective in our calling. The church is not mobile. People's lives aren't changed. Restoration isn't taking place because we're stuck in concrete. Don't let fear run your life. Here's the thing. This life is temporary, and I've got great news. This is not our final destination. You and I, we're, we're passing through. We're passing through. This is not it. The hopelessness of this world, no, no, no. He's coming back. He's gonna create a new heaven and a new earth. We will spend eternity with him. We're gonna go through things, but you have a purpose while you are here. The third place excuses come from, it's a scarcity mentality. The servant says, hey, let's go see Samuel. Saul, he didn't look through a lens of faith, he looked through a lens of scarcity. In verse seven, Saul said to his servant, but if we go, what can we give the man? The food in our sacks is gone, we have no, food, no gift to take to the man of God, what do we have? Essentially, Saul says, listen, we don't have enough. And the crazy part of this is the servant who really should be the one looking through a lens of scarcity, 
He probably didn't have great circumstances. He probably didn't have a plethora of extra materialistic things. He's the one who should have looked at this and be like, hey, four towns, we're on the way to the fifth. Let's go back. They're gonna start worrying about us. No, no, no. The servant saw what could be done. Saul looked through a lens of what couldn't be done. Fear and scarcity is plaguing our world. If you want to be fearful, you want to worry about diesel gas, and if, if we're going to run out of meat and all this, turn on the news. They've got all, all that you need right there to be stuck in fear and scarcity. Here's the, here's the truth. As Christians, we do not operate like the world. We do not operate like the world. The same things that makes the world tick is not what ticks us. We don't walk by what we see. We walk by faith. I want you to know that it doesn't matter where you've come from in your life. It doesn't matter what you've been through or what your circumstances say. I believe that on the other side of this hurt, on the other side of this pain, on the other side of this lack, there is something better for you. I really believe that because that's what God's word says. Don't lose sight of God's promises by getting blinded by your circumstances. There's hope. It's not in our president. It's not in the government. It's not in the world leaders. We have a hope in his name is Jesus and he's coming back. We can always find a reason why something can't be done or, or, or why we don't have enough. So, so what do we do with our excuses? I believe that through the power of Christ Jesus, you are more than an overcomer. Amen. It's not just a possibility of overcoming. The Bible says you are more than an overcomer through Christ Jesus. And you have a mission. You're not here by accident. This last year or this year, I did something really stupid. I did a triathlon, okay? So last year I watched like a David Goggins video. I got really excited. He made me feel really bad about myself and I was like, I gotta do something hard, man. I gotta do something really difficult. So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna do a triathlon. I've never, I've never ran before. I, I, you know, the only place I ran to was lunch growing up. So I was like, I wanna do something difficult. So I bought the running shoes. I bought the bike, I bought the clip-in shoes, I bought the helmet, I bought these glasses for, to, you know, so I look cool and, and, and the wind doesn't hurt my eyes when I'm going fast on the Pinellas Trail. I was excited. I was like, let's do something hard. Well, my first day of training came around. I was like, you know what, it's five o'clock in the morning, I'm gonna wake up at five o'clock in the morning, I'm gonna do this, everything, I bought everything, it's time to go. My alarm goes off at 5 a.m. I look over at my wife, and she just looks so peaceful. She looked so comfortable, and I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna join you, baby. I, I turned the alarm off, and I was like, I'll, I'll start tomorrow. Tomorrow's the day, Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday came around and set the alarm for five o'clock. I woke up. Them boogies that day in the eye were just super heavy, and I just, I turned the alarm off again. I was like, no, this, is, this isn't gonna work. Well, Wednesday came around. Another David Goggins video came through. And I was like, you know what, this is the day. How, how can I ensure that I'm going to get up? So what did I do? I got up, I, I packed my lunch for the next day, I made my breakfast, I, I got my shoes, I put all my clothes out, I got my clothes ready for work. I, I did everything that I could possibly make an excuse for the next morning of I've gotta get up, I gotta do this. Everything was done. That next morning, I got up. I went and I trained and I almost died on the Pinellas Trail. <laughs> I got up, what did I do? I pre-decided. This isn't something that I'm gonna try to do. This is something that I'm going to do. So how do you overcome excuses? The first thing is this, you overcome excuses by discipline. A lot of times in our life, we have intentions. I'm gonna be the husband God's created me to be. I'm gonna lead my family. I'm gonna be the mother God's created me to be. I'm gonna start serving. I'm gonna start a small group. I'm gonna start talking about God and work. We're excited. Here's the problem. 
intentions and excitements don't lead us to action. Yeah, I wanna work out, I wanna, I wanna get in God's word, I, wa- I wanna do these different. Intentions mean absolutely nothing without actions and disciplines. Intentions, they're great, but they don't see you through. I want you to know that who you're gonna become in the next five to 10 years will be based on the disciplines that you establish today. Who you are today is a direct reflection of the disciplines that you've exercised so far in your life. It starts today. In Galatians 6, 7, it says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. So what are you sowing into your life today? What are you sowing into the kingdom of God today? Because this is God's word. This is what you are going to reap in your life. If you plant laziness, you're not getting promoted. If you plant anger, no one wants to be around you. If you plant lust and you're constantly watching pornography, your wife it does not want to be with you. There, that will kill your intimacy. If you plant evil, you will reap destruction. That's what you will gain in return. But if you plant faithfulness, consistency, discipline, you will gain this in return. And what the Bible says about the harvest You don't just reap what you plant. It multiplies 60, 100 times fold. And it takes time. A lot of times we want to be there tomorrow. The thing with harvesting is it takes a season for the harvest. It's going, you will reap your harvest in a different season. I meet with a lot of young guys and and I mentor them. And I, you know, from people who have known the Lord since they were children, people who just came to know the Lord, and they come to me, and they're like, man, Pastor Andrew, I'm, I'm trying so hard. I'm trying to stop watching that. I'm trying to get away from this addiction. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get in God's word. And one of the things that I tell them, and this is something I'm gonna tell you today, is remove the word trying from your vocabulary. Remove the word trying from your vocabulary. As Christians, we're not trying for righteousness. We are training for righteousness. We're training. You're gonna fall. You're gonna mess up. You're gonna come up short. But when I'm training, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna get back up. I'm gonna dust myself up. Why? Because I'm not trying. I'm training. I'm training for righteousness. I'm training for my calling. I'm not gonna try to get in God's word. I'm not gonna try to get into his presence. I'm not gonna try to get my my kids and my family to church. I have already decided this is what I'm going to do. You either do it or you don't. You either are who you say you are or you're not. There is no middle ground. When I first started seeking God, I was 18 years old, I was was. I was stuck in addiction. I was stuck to so many different sins in my life. And I'm like, Lord, I have tried everything. I'm putting this away. Was it hard? Absolutely. Did I have to go through seasons that were really, really hard to get away from people and addictions and different things in my life? Yes. But I made the choice. I am going to get in the presence of God. I'm going to get up at five o'clock in the morning. I'm not telling you to get up at five. This is what I decided. I'm getting up at five o'clock in the morning. I am getting to my secret place and I am going to pursue God. It's not based on other people. Sometimes, you know, like groups are important. People encourage you. But listen, you need a relationship with God, not based on other people. Get into the secret place. Get with God. Get into your war room. Making this decision of this isn't just something I do on a Sunday or once a month on a worship Wednesday. No, no, no. 
I am a follower of Jesus. I am not trying to follow God. I am choosing. I am training. I'm training for righteousness. There'll always be another excuse. So if not now, then, then when? What disciplines do you need to establish today in your life to start moving yourself into all that God has for you? The next way we overcome excuses, it's by faith. It's so powerful, this servant looked through a lens of faith rather than scarcity and fear. Saul, he pushes back to the servant and says, the servant answered him again. Look what he said. He, sa I ha he said, I have a quarter of a shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God so that he will tell us what way to take. I've got a little bit of money. So in this time, a quarter of a shekel of silver, this was like one day's worth of labor in a vineyard. I don't have much, but I've got something. When I first came into ministry, I, I felt the calling at a very, very young age had a prophesied over my life, you're gonna go into ministry, you are going to help lead a church. I was scared. And I ran from that for a long time in my life. Eventually, Pastor Glenn called me and said, hey, we've got an opening for to be the youth pastor. And I was like, okay, this is time. I gotta stop running. This is what I need to do. But I didn't have the faith, man. I was scared. I was nervous. I never preached before. I've never done that. I've led small groups, but I never preached to anybody before in, in a public setting. I was, I was scared. I looked at the people who were in ministry. They had like skinny jeans and like V-neck shirts. And I'm like, I don't look like them. They don't even lift weights. I don't, how am I going to be able to do this? How am I gonna do it? I like to, I like to fish. I like to hunt. They, they like to drink coffee at the Starbucks. How, how am I going to do this? I remember sitting down with Pastor Tim one day and I was like, man, I don't know if I can do this, man. People are gonna compare me to my dad. People are, I, 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 I'm not like these people. They drink too much coffee. I don't know. How. He looked at me and he said, listen, Andrew, before the foundation of the earth, God knew what you were created to do. You are called to this. You cannot run from this anymore. You will be okay but you gotta have faith. He equipped me. A lot of times when, when, we're, when we're going along in our life, we're like, man, I don't feel equipped, I don't feel ready. What I can tell you about God is he will equip you along the way. He will encourage you, he will put people in your path. That's what he did for me. He'll do it for you too. I want you to know, church, the little bit of faith that you have, God can do so much more with it than you possibly can think. Are, are the headlines in, in the news and everything else, are they overwhelming? Of course, are things unstable? Yep. Does meat cost more than it did a year ago? Yes. But guess what? God is right here with us. So many times people are looking through a lens of fear and scarcity. I'm here to tell you today that God wants to give you a new prescription. A new prescription. Listen, with our human eyes, what we see when we're walking in our flesh, it is turmoil. People in this world, they have no hope. They're fearful. They're stressed out looking at interest rates, looking at the price of food. It's overwhelming. So you have an opportunity. You can look through the lens of fear and scarcity and constant worry, or you can allow God to give you a new prescription. A prescription where you can see clearly, where you don't have to walk in fear, but you can see the way God truly wants you to see them. You need a new prescription. Saul, he needed a friend to help him see things differently, to help them see that there's hope. What I ask you today is that you consider me a friend today. I truly believe that God has given me this message for you today for a new prescription, that you can see things differently so you don't walk by fear or by what you see, but walk by faith. Because the last time I checked, God's still on the throne. God's still in control. When I was a kid, we used to sing this song, he's got the whole world 
in his hand. And man, we had fun with that song. We were like dancing to it. We would like do raps to that song. But, but we believe that, right? God, he's got the whole world except my finances. He's got the whole world except my past trauma. He's got the whole world except my relational issues. <laughs> right? In the Bible, hundreds of times it says, do not fear. I think he's trying to tell us something, right? We don't need to fear. Here's some scriptures. It says, do not fear. I am with you. I will strengthen you. What can mere mortals do to me? He will fight for you. The Lord, he goes before you. He will anoint your footsteps. He takes care of the birds in the air. How much more does he love you? Saul almost missed his destiny because of excuses. That doesn't have to be your story. So what excuses have you been making that are holding you back? What area of your life have you been looking through a lens of fear and scarcity where you need to start walking by faith and not by sight? Maybe you feel particularly burdened by your finances or, or your marriage. It's time for faith to rise up. It's time for discipline to set in. Every situation in your life, the good, the bad, the ugly, the hurt, the pain, hope and faith have something to say about that. That hope is Jesus. Would you bow your heads and pray with me today? Maybe you're in here today, and in your life you feel, man, I have no hope at all. I've put my hope in things of this world. I've, I've tried to do it in my own power, my own strength. I'm here to tell you today, you don't have to do it alone anymore. Our hope is in Jesus Christ for what he did for us on the cross. He took your sins so that we could have eternal life. The Lamb of God was sacrificed so that you and I could have eternal life. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe that he was raised on the third day, then you will be saved. I want you to know that a new start is available to you today. To put your faith, to put your hope and your trust, not in things of this world, but in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The one who truly holds your tomorrow. So if you're here today and say, I, I want that. I want salvation. I want to put my hope and my trust in God. What I'm going to ask you to do with every head bowed and every eye closed, on the count of three, just raise your hands and I want to pray for you. One, two, three. Hands already going up. Amen. Amen. You can put your hands down. The heavens are rejoicing. So what I'm going to ask you to do if you raise your hand, this is the kickstart of your relationship with God. He's a relational God. He wants to speak to you. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is just say a prayer to him. Lord, forgive me of my sins. I'm changing the goal of my life today. It's not about myself, it's about you. Declare his lordship over your life right now as I pray over you. Lord, I thank you for the people that are receiving you as their Lord and Savior today. I pray, God, that you would create in them a new heart, a heart that's responsive, ready to do your will. Today, we turn our back on who we were and we fix our eyes on you. We change the goal of our life. We're chasing after you. Today we declare, Lord, that you are our God, that you are our savior, and that you are our very best friend. Be with these people along their way on their journey, God. Give them peace, give them joy, give them purpose, hope in a hopeless world. In your name I pray, amen. Amen, thank you, Pastor Andrew. Beautiful message. Would you stand with me now to receive your blessing? And as you're standing, as the altar prayer team comes to the front, as soon as I say this blessing over you and you're dismissed, if you'd like prayer for any reason, please come see one of our altar prayer team members. And if you raised your hand for the first time, we have a gift we'd like to give you. It's a book called A Fresh Start with God, just to help you in this journey. But to receive your blessing right now, if you just open your hearts before the Lord, maybe turn your palms upward in an attitude of receiving. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you 
and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We love you, church. We'll see you this Worship Wednesday.